Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session. This is our book reading session. It's called Seeding Innovation, an exclusive book reading with author Robin O'Brien. My name is Amanda White. I'm the conference content manager for Supply Side. Uh, according to a Forbes survey on imposter syndrome, 61% of professionals admit to struggling with imposter syndrome at some point in their careers. Robin O'Brien argues that this internal battle could be a key to unlocking innovation. Our session objectives for today are how to tackle imposter syndrome, learn the STOP protocol to stop self-sabotage, and how to build a resilient mindset. Robin O'Brien is our speaker for today. She wrote the book, Seeding Innovation, which I read and, and absolutely loved. As a thought leader in food and agriculture, Robin has spent over a decade raising awareness on the importance of transparency, sustainability, and innovation. Seeding Innovation captures her vision for a future where collaboration and creativity can solve the industry's biggest challenges. Please welcome Robin to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there we go. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, there's so much going on out there, and I appreciate you guys carving out this window for us, and most importantly, for you. The work that I have done over the last 15 years, if anybody had suggested that I would be in this position when I was a kid or a young woman coming through grad school, I would have said, you're totally nuts. I was not an environmentalist. I was not a sustainability expert. I was the recipient of a very whitewashed education, so I was pretty clueless. And um, life has a funny way of really taking you to your knees. And the older I got, the more I saw that happening, and I thought, how do I actually just, instead of fighting this, instead of trying to fight this change, instead of trying to like fight it, what would happen if I just completely released into it? And that was a bit of a foreign concept. I didn't have anybody that could model anything like that. But what we find ourselves on the front of right now is the need for radical change. And we can feel it this week ahead of the election. There is so much tension in our country right now. You could cut it like a knife. A friend the other day said, really, you know, I wish that we just all had two weeks off until the other side of the election because we're all waiting to see what happens next week. But what we're feeling, what we're feeling are massive growing pains. Our country right now is going through incredible growth. And we're going from what feels like a teenager that thinks they know everything to this young adult that is realizing, as I did, how little I actually knew. And while that story for me, I mean, my background was graduated as a top woman in my class from business school, went to work on a team that managed 20 billion in assets, the only woman on the team, it was very executional, it was very mathematical, it was not emotional, and I really liked it that way because I felt like I was in control. But then when my youngest child was born and she had this life-threatening allergic reaction and I started to pull at these threads and go back to those analysts and go back to people at Goldman Sachs and go back to people at Morgan Stanley and start to ask these questions and thread these threads together, it was this incredibly destabilizing, incredibly humbling and incredibly terrifying awareness of how little I actually knew. And once I released into that, once I stopped fighting how little I knew and just released completely into that, there was this incredible transformation that happened where rather than trying to present as if I knew everything, which I clearly didn't, I could approach everything as if I was a student with this curiosity and this hunger to learn. And I think when we are at the front of change and when we are at the front of innovation, which you know, you walk around this show, that's what it is. It's the hunger of a curious student that is the energy that you need that will serve you well. And so as I began this exploratory adventure of what is actually happening here, how have we inherited systems that are so fundamentally flawed that they extract so much from so many of us? And what could we possibly do to change it? 
And so for me, the work that I have always done, the absolute compass of my work is courage. And if you take the word courage and you break it down, the word courage is actually derived from the Latin word core, which means heart. This is my heart's work. There is nothing else that I will be doing until the end of time. I am a student on a very vertical learning curve. I would invite you to give yourself permission to be the same. That in that exploratory adventure and in that curiosity, you get to participate in an experience and in an adventure that is beyond anything you could possibly imagine. If I had tried to control this, if I had tried to control for the outcome of this, there's no way, there's absolutely no way I would be where I am today. I had to release into it and allow that curiosity and that exploration and the partnerships and the collaboration to carry me. And so in the early years of that work, what that felt like was really, you know, waking up to the fact, and this was back in like 2007, 2008, that the food system's highly contaminated. It's polluted. It's full of a lot of ingredients that are not used anywhere else in the world. We know that. What that enables then is this need for incredible innovation and incredible collaboration to uplevel this system. And it requires absolutely every single part of it, from policy to the farmers. And what I found was, in the early years, I really wanted Aaron Brockovich to do this. I did not want to do it. I did not want to have to be the whistleblower. I did not want to stick my neck out. People kept saying, you're like Aaron Brockovich in the food system. You're like Aaron Brockovich. I kept thinking, that's great. I've just got to figure out how to connect with Aaron Brockovich, and then I can hand it to her, and then she's going to do it. And so I, I did. I reached out to Aaron Brockovich, and it took me two weeks probably to write a four-sentence email to Aaron Brockovich because I'm super type A. And I didn't want her to think I was crazy. And I was like, okay, my fourth child had this allergic reaction. Here's what I have unearthed. You know, Monsanto's funding this very large nonprofit in the food allergy space. Fact, 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 fact. Took me two weeks to write a four-sentence email. And when I sent it, my goal was for her to pick it up and take it on as one of the initiatives that she took on. Four days after I sent that email, I, I to like my absolute shock and glee, Erin Brockovich replied. And she's like, I am so glad someone is finally taking this on. My brother died from a life-threatening allergic reaction. And in that moment, I thought, oh my gosh, I have to do, I, I, I have to do this. If Erin Brockovich is basically saying, thank you, for doing this and taking this on, I have to do this. And something that I talk a lot about in seeding innovation is what I call your FQ, and it's your ability to figure stuff out. We all have an FQ score. Part of it comes from the scrappiness we were raised as a child with, any adversity that we came up you know, through childhood with, our intelligence, our creativity, our curiosity, our support system, all of that goes into this function, this equation, that is your FQ score. And something I've always really known about myself is I can figure shit out. I can figure it out. If I don't know the answers, I can usually run down somebody who does. And what I would invite you to consider is that none of us can figure any of this out by ourselves. Like, it would be useless. What you can do is build what I call your scaffolding. And your scaffolding is like when this amazing building was being constructed, imagine the scaffolding that went around it. As some of these booths were being constructed, imagine the scaffolding that went around it as it was constructed. We are no different. And we require scaffolding to grow and become the leaders and the full people that we are meant to be. So with that, I started to get really intentional about who is around me, you know, who do I want to have around me? And in the early years, I knew that the science was my weak link, so I, I surrounded myself with brilliant scientists, and they were from all over the world. I knew that's where I was exposed, so that was part of my scaffolding. The other were the people that just have your back, the ones who you turn to no matter what, and they have your back. And for me, they didn't come from the normal places. It didn't come from my spouse. It didn't come from my siblings. It didn't come from my parents. For a lot of people, that's what they'll tell you. That's who they turn to. For me, it didn't come from those places. It was like the universe just like dropped in these amazing people who at the absolute right time suddenly appeared in exactly the role that I needed them to appear in as a mentor, as a friend, as a cheerleader. When those people appear in your life, or if they already exist, 
love them with everything that you have because they are absolute gold, the ones who have your back. And so as I began to feel this support with this scaffolding system, again, it, it sort of awakened in me this, the, the capabilities that I knew I could deliver forward. But I think one of the things that we get stuck in as individuals is like, and what I did, is where you see someone like Aaron Brockovich and you think, okay, should I model myself on that? You shouldn't at all. Because each one of you sitting here, you are so uniquely designed your unique combination of skill sets, your unique combination of relationships, your unique combination of pa uh, passions, no one else can be like you. And that's the whole point, is you are actually supposed to be here in this lifetime, living at that highest capacity that you are here to live, to not duplicate or replicate anybody else. Sure, you can look to somebody like Erin Brockovich and be completely inspired by her courage, but you can't be Aaron Brockovich. I could not be Aaron Brockovich. I don't wanna be Aaron Brockovich because everything that I am, that I had to give, I had to get really comfortable with owning that and that authenticity. And what I will tell you is that that authenticity and then the vulnerability that comes with really sitting with all of this stuff, when you really sit with yourself and you have to get really honest with who you are, that is a superpower. I am convinced that authenticity is a superpower because then no one, no one, no one will be able to take away what you create. And so as I sat with that, I thought, you know, what are the things, what are the things that are me? And in this book, one of the exercises that I have the reader do is at the end of every chapter, I have you take an inventory so that by the end of the book, I, you have what I call a personal balance sheet, which is these are the things about you that are absolutely your assets. And these are the things about you that are your liabilities. And everyone, every company has both assets and liabilities. We all do. And you are able to better manage your life and your career when you are really honest about what these things are. And so in the beginning, I thought, you know, what are my assets? This passion, this curiosity, this intelligence, these resources that I had in my education, this network that I've been building my entire life, those are incredible assets. What were my liabilities? I am really stubborn. And I realized, you know, I can run headlong into something and then, you know, my liabilities of not knowing the science and needing to support myself there. Once you identify your liabilities, you can work with them instead of trying to hide them. And so as the work continued, what became really, really fascinating was as I was able to really stand in that place with total honesty, it invited other people to do the same. And I found that I started to hear from CEOs of global food companies. When I gave that TED Talk, I gave a TED Talk in 2011 that was based on my first book. No one was talking about this in 2011. I was way ahead of the curve. <clears throat> and when I took that stage in Austin, Texas, and I had never spoken to a group of 600 people, nothing that size before, I remember I just said a prayer to please let my heart speak. It wasn't about me. I just felt that I was just this messenger that this, this message had to come through. And when I was done, the, the audience started to stand up and I remember thinking there was a slide behind me that must have said like seventh inning stretch, you know, stand up. And the curator came on stage and she said, you need to stay because we don't give standing ovations in Texas very often. And I realized what was happening was that an audience in the middle of Texas, which still largely conservative, was not participating in the food movement in 2011, they were rising to this. And I still will maintain that food security is national security and protecting the health of our population is one of the most patriotic things that we can do. It's nonpartisan. It's not even bipartisan. It is nonpartisan. It is patriotic to, pr to protect the health of our families. And so from that TED Talk, when that thing went online, my life changed. My life didn't change with the first book in 2009. It changed with that TED Talk. Because all of a sudden, people could find me. All of Monsanto's people could find me. All of the Corn Refiners Association people could find me. All of the scientists funded by Monsanto could find me. And they found me. And they did everything they could to condescend, marginalize, dismiss, belittle, threaten, scare, intimidate, all of it. And I remember thinking, if this is everything they are throwing at me, we've got this. 
and I knew I had to build a bigger team. And then what was absolutely remarkable was about two to three weeks after that talk went online, I got an email from the CEO of Nestle's frozen food division. So the division that makes Stouffer's, Lean Cuisines, Hot Pockets. And he emailed and he said, you can say things I can't say. I need you to come out to Nestle and I need you to work with my team because I am so concerned that we are losing market share and that this building that we're all in is gonna go from five floors to four to three to two to one and I'm gonna lay off all of these employees that I love. So from Boulder, I flew out to Solon, Ohio to meet with Nestle's frozen food division and the CEO there. At that point, people in Boulder were like, you're nuts, like it's Nestle. How are they gonna change anything? And I remember looking at this friend and saying, how do you actually change anything if you're not brave enough to sit at the table and have the conversation? So I flew to Ohio. The first night we made gourmet Hot Pockets and Lean Cuisines with all of these beautiful fresh vegetables in this gorgeous kitchen, sitting on top of this giant building. It was beautiful on these little trays and I was sitting next to the CEO of Nestle's frozen food division and he knew everything. He had a son with autism. He was totally deathly afraid and he was leaning and he was right at my shoulder and I turned to him and I said, Frank, you know everything. Like you know everything because in these global food companies, most senior leaders have worked in Europe or Asia or Australia where food integrity and those standards are light years higher than ours. And so they know, they know that they are operating from that double standard place and he was absolutely no different. And I said, Frank, you know this, what are you afraid of? And he leaned in and without hesitating, he said, I'm afraid of my board of directors. So I thought, okay, how do we actually A, educate these boards and B, diversify them? Because if women are in charge of 85% of household purchases and the birth of that first child is when a family goes through a pretty radical transformation in what they're putting into their kitchen, Women play an incredibly important role here. And then on top of that, when you look at the fact that 60 to 80% of smallholder farmers around the world are women, they're the ones on the ground doing whatever we're gonna be doing to the soil and to those crops. And then in the US, when you look at the fact that now 60% of college graduates are women, women are highly educated, they're coming into the workforce with these values and with these beliefs. And then I think what was probably the most fascinating to me is I was pulling the research around female leadership because in my gut, I knew this to be true. And I kept thinking, why do I know this to be true? And I think when you look to any species outside of us, when you look outside of us, when you look at all of the other species in nature, there's a balance between the masculine and feminine. They don't argue about it. They don't put policies in place. It just exists, that equilibrium between the masculine and the feminine. And yet our species, this one species, went like this. And it's in that discord and it's in that disconnect and it's in that tension that all of a sudden, like we energetically are throwing things off. And so how do we restore that equilibrium? How do we restore that balance between the masculine and the feminine? It's not either or. It's this perfect equilibrium that we need to get back to. And it was fascinating because as I really started to research that, the outperformance of a team that has black women in leadership is 30%. The outperformance of a team that has women in leadership, you put a woman in as CEO within the first two years, you will outperform by 20%. And I remember looking at this and thinking, if these were products, you were walking around and you had a product that was outperforming by 30% or 20%, you would be doing everything you could to make sure that everybody knew about that product. So how do, we, how do we create these hybrid governance teams? Because that's actually what needs to happen. And so as I've kind of continued through this whole process, it's been fascinating. And I know that anyone sitting here today would have experienced the same thing because I think it's just part of the human experience. And that is that we all have these naysayers in our lives. I mean, it's like, it, maybe it's a mom, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a negative friend, but we all have that person in our life that is just a naysayer. And they just, that energy just brings you way down, brings you way down. 
And something I learned was to sort of honor the naysayer for whatever it is that's going on in their life, that they need to be that negative naysaying person and gently move them out of the way because to create the kind of change and pioneer the kind of changes that we need to see in our, in our systems, all of them, that naysayer negativity is, is quite corrosive and toxic. And then the other thing that I encountered in the process was this kind of, who am I to do this? Like, who, who am I to do this? And you have to flip that question on its head. Who are you not to? You have your own unique design. You have your own unique talents. You have your own unique skills. Who are you not to bring everything that you are to this? And you cannot do it by yourself. So who is on your team? Who are the people that are on your team and how do you continue to build that team? And something I learned early on was just to continue to reach out to people to not be afraid of no. Sometimes no is just not yet. It's a not yet. And you just keep reaching out and you keep building your team and you keep exercising that courage because it is like any other muscle that's in your body. The more you use that courage, the stronger it gets. And so as I was coming through this and really looking at this food system, and I mean, we really like, what we have in our hands today is, is, is a mess. But there's policy that we can change, there are practices that we can change, there's capital flow that we can change, and there's so much that we can do. And one of the things that I sat with was, you know, thinking about when I'm 80 and grandchildren are asking, when you knew that this was happening, when it became screamingly obvious that the food system is, is polluted and harming the health of not only our families, our country, our soil, our farmers. What did you do? And we'll be able to say we did everything we could. We came together and bravely challenged what was conventional and built something that was so much smarter, smarter for the health of our families, smarter for the health of farmers, smarter for the health of the farm economy, and smarter for the health of the environment. Because what we have created is a highly abusive system. And if capital is the first ingredient in any of these things, which it is, that capital has come in in a highly, highly extractive manner. And so for us to be thinking about what are other sources of capital, and we're starting to see that emerge. You see these incredible organizations like the Fearless Fund. You see incredible impact organizations that are saying, we will give you your returns and also our moral compass is planetary integrity. And that, those are the organizations, and those are the leaders, and those are the people that are really tip of the sphere pioneering this change. And something that I often say, and it's so true, is that you know a pioneer by the number of arrows they have in their back because of the naysayers and because of the people that are trying to drag you down. And what I have come to understand today is that that is actually part of the journey is that when you are being challenged by someone, that is actually your opportunity to push through and grow, to really birth yourself into this higher level, into this next level of leadership, into this higher version of yourself that you, you know you are capable of becoming. But I think probably one of the hardest, hardest things that I had to get through, I could handle, I could handle the, the four higher scientists from Monsanto, I could handle the blistering, I could handle the blonde crap they threw at me and the condescension and the ridicule and all of these things, I could handle that. The thing that was the hardest for me to get through was the voice in my head. Because I think we all have these voices in our head that is like, who are you to do that? And we are really mean to ourselves. And I remember one day thinking something just horrifically mean about myself and looking at my daughter and thinking if she ever said that to herself, I would do everything I could to erase it, unwind it, and I would never say something out loud to someone else that I say as meanly as I say to myself. So what's that about? And I thought, how do you actually change that? Because if I've got this voice in my head, it doesn't matter what anything looks like on the outside, if this is going on on the inside, like th that is toxic, toxic. And I thought, let me suspend this voice for a second and see what's going on here. And so I suspended the voice and I thought, whose voice is that? And I really invite you to do this exercise. When that voice comes on in your head, and you know what I'm talking about, you know the voice. 
When it comes on in your head, suspend it for a second and actually create a little bit of space from it because you feel like it's in you, it's not. Create that space and look at that voice and say, okay, is it masculine? Is it feminine? Is it a dad? Is it a mom? Is it a spouse? Is it a teacher you once had? Who is that critic in your head? And more often than not, I would say almost 100% of the time, you will find that that voice is not yours. You have adopted that from some point earlier in your life. In my case, it was my mother. And I think what she was probably trying to do was protect me from what she was afraid was going to cause great harm. I, I do want to believe that it was well intended, but that voice was so negative and so critical. And I remember thinking, thank you, mom, for what you were trying to do here, but you are not my voice. So S, for this stop protocol that I developed, the S is suspend the voice. So you can actually stop for a minute and identify it. The T in the stop protocol that I developed to really help harness this, the T is tone police it. Because I promise you would never, ever, to someone that you love, speak the way and as cruelly as we speak to ourselves. The O is offer an alternative. And here's where I was like, oh God, now what do I do? You know, I'm, I have lived for 50 years with this really mean voice in my head. How do I create an alternative? What is the alternative that I offer? And I remember reading once, what if we actually spoke to ourselves the way that we talk to our dogs? And you think about like the way an animal comes into your life and the highest vibration on any energetic chart, one of the highest vibrations is a happy dog where the whole dog is shaking, not just their tail, but like their whole being is shaking because they're so excited to see you. And the way that you talk to them and the way that you show love. And I thought, what if that's the voice or some kind of, you know, create some kind of kind, if it was a godmother you had in your life, I have an amazing godmother, that voice that voice that voice in my head that kind voice calls me robbie and that voice i thought okay I've, every time i hear this mean voice stop her and replace it with the kind voice until the kind voice becomes the dominant voice in your head so i was i was giving this talk to um, a global corporate group and one of the men raised his hand and he said how long did it take you to rewire that voice and it took me a year because the P of stop protocol is you have to practice it. And just like courage is a muscle, controlling that negative naysaying voice in your head, that critic is a muscle too. And I would argue that the most detrimental thing to most of us is that critic that is between our ears. It holds us back. It keeps you from living your highest and fullest potential. And there are so many problems that are in our system. When you look at the financial discrimination, I still, to this day, even on the board of the Regenerative Organic Alliance, I struggle with the word regenerative because so many of the problems that we have in agriculture today are structured into the system because of the financials. And what we did was in fundamentally changing the way that we grow food and genetically engineering seeds and then requiring farmers to license and trademark and patent, you know, the patenting that happened. It changed the financial model on the farm so that farmers couldn't just save seeds year after year after year. They had to take out loans. So then they had to qualify for loans. And so then guess what happened? Because we'd taken land away from black farmers, only the white farmers qualified for the loans. So the black farmers were discriminated against. White farmers moved forward. They qualified in the credit system for the loan so that they could purchase the seeds and purchase the chemicals. And what we ended up doing was abandoning completely the wisdom that we now call regeneration. So those black farming families hold the wisdom of how to care for the soil because they were so discriminated against that they never had access to the agrochemical model in the first place. And so really, again, it's this, what we actually are asking for is this integration of bringing all of these pieces back together to create this whole that is our country. And if you look at any one thread, and I look at farming in America, it's 70% white male. You look at finance in America, it's 98% white male. You have one skinny white thread. And we know that a fabric woven together of all of these different threads and all of these different colors is going to be so much stronger than that skinny white thread. And so that is the invitation and the data supports it. 
that when you have these hybrid teams, you will outperform. And so when we get into these arguments about DEI, and I mean, right now it is all over the news. To me, it's like, I don't care what you want to call it. What you want is that integration of the masculine and the feminine, of this diversification, because it makes a far stronger fabric than that one single thread. And for me, the work that I do, food security is national security. There is not a doubt in my mind that this is a national security issue. It is that important. So the work that all of you are doing could not be more critical. And so in this book, which I really like, I loved, loved, loved writing this book because my first book, The Unhealthy Truth, was really like, here's all the problems. And I, I'm, I'm not a naysayer, I'm not a negative person. To have to be the whistleblower was really hard. That was hard for me personally. And then with this book, I could come along and say, here are these amazing examples of innovation and creativity and passion and purpose and walk you through exercises that you can do so that you can really kind of hone in on what that is for you personally and then find your people so that you can really start to build this together. And don't be afraid to start small. The very first talk that I ever gave was at the Jewish Community Center in, in Boulder and six people came. One was my kid's pediatrician, the other was a dietitian friend. Those two ended up meeting at that thing and got married, which I still to this day believe was sort of a blessing on the whole thing, but there were six people. If I hadn't said yes to that, I never would have been on the stage at the World Bank in May. It just, you have to say yes, you can't be afraid to start small. We all learned how to ride a bike in increments. You know, a baby learns how to talk in increments. This is no different as you grow into the leader and the fullness of everything that you are meant to be. So I think we probably have some time um, for some questions. And I'm just so grateful that all of you are here because what I would love to imagine is that 10 years from now, one of you is sitting up here talking about the leadership that you represent and the changes that you've made, because that really is the invitation. It is an all hands on deck moment across every sector, across all of these challenges, are all of these opportunities for all of us to participate and to engage. So thank you so much for the participation and the engagement today. Thank you, yes, give her a round of applause. I love, I love that we brought you here. Um, I loved the book. I was wondering if you would share the serendipitous moment of how it all started. I love serendipity and I feel like we don't really have much of that because of the hustle and bustle and rush and we're all yeah. tired, uh, we're distracted. And so, yeah, just share like how the book came about. There's so much serendipity in this book. So last April, my youngest child was about to graduate high school and she turned to me and she was like, mom, are you gonna be okay with an empty nest? I mean, I'd raised four children and I was like, I'm gonna be fine. And then I went to coffee with a friend and he, he was, he's, you know, we were talking and he just was so worried about how acute these crises are becoming. And we were talking about our kids and I said, somebody needs to write a business leadership book that brings this forward, but brings it forward in a human way, not just in the operational way. Because there's tons of business leadership books that tell you how to operationalize everything. I, to my toes, believe that this is the work. You got to do this, and then everything operationalizes from there. So I said, somebody needs to write this business leadership book, you know, that sort of teaches this operas, how to operate, you know, from this internal mode. And I am not kidding, two days later, Two days later, I get an email unsolicited from a senior editor at Wiley Publishing, and he says, have you thought about writing a business leadership book? You have a very unique sort of take on all of this. And I was like, is someone bugging my life? Like, is my car bugged? And I emailed him back. I'm like, Brian, I literally just said this two days ago to a friend. And so it fell out just so incredibly quickly and so beautifully, and that continued to happen. My youngest is at NYU, and she was going to be in Madrid for the year, and so I decided I would write the book. I'd take her over, move her into her dorm, and write the book from this little town on the coast of Portugal where I could literally shut out the world, lock in, and write it. And I picked this town because of the VRB. I mean, it was just random. And I picked the town, and I took the train from Lisbon to this little town, and I get to the town. I don't speak any Portuguese, and the name of the town is Granja. And the meaning of granja in Portuguese is farm. So it just, it continues. I think you have to, one of the, one of the things I've allowed is 
you have to leave a little bit of room for the magic. We, we try to control everything. And when we do, it doesn't allow for just these amazing magic moments. And we've all had them where you meet someone and it just feels like you've suddenly like dropped in with a new old friend. But there really is, um, there is so much serendipity and there is so much magic if you really can hold that space for it. Thank you, that's beautiful. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Any questions? We have a mic runner if, if you do. Well, I could keep going. Um, so, you know, I read the book over the last couple of weeks and I noticed um, it's written more towards entrepreneurs, which is near and dear to my heart as a former entrepreneur. Um, and many of our attendees are not entrepreneurs. So what would you, like, how can they tackle these principles um, working for a company? I think, you know, I, I don't, I, I understand that it is a story of entrepreneurship, but I also see it as a story of growth. And within every big company, there is the entrepreneur too, and the innovation that's required to successfully lead inside of a big company. But then I just feel like there's so much in personal development that's required of, of all of us. And that that growth can be really scary at times, but it's also where all of this magic happens. You stay in your comfort zone, it's completely predictable and it's com completely safe, and you know exactly what you're gonna get and you're never gonna grow. And I think you know to, to really consider whether you're a manager or a young person on a team, growth feels good. It is, again, to get back to nature, that we are actually part of nature, you plant a seed in your garden and it grows. Like, we are supposed to grow. And so to think about it as ways to foster the innovation and foster the growth in your team and in your company and to build resilient mindsets, I also think that's really incredibly important because one of the best pieces of advice I got early in my career is that life will throw curveballs. And I have had some absolutely insanely wickedly hard curveballs thrown at me. Life will throw curveballs. Your success depends on how you respond to them. Like none of us get out of here alive without those curveballs. The success of your life, personally or professionally, depends on how you respond to those curveballs. So I think, you know, yes, there are examples of entrepreneurship, but for me, this is about business development, personal development, and growth. Perfect. Oh, we have a question from an audience member. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the pioneering leadership and motherhood? I have a young child and sometimes my, one of my brain blocks is you have to wait until he's older before you can really go and charge forth and change things, but I'd love to hear about how you navigated that. You know, I did not have examples of working mothers in my life when the kids were younger and now they're 19 to 24. And I remember thinking, again, like these rules that are so arbitrary that maybe our mothers or grandmothers might have had for us, you really, it's a very personal thing. You have to do what works for you. And I've always been somebody that gets up really early. So that, you know, has always been my sacred time. When I was in the investment world, we had to be on the desk at 6.30 in the morning. I'm so grateful for that early conditioning because that time before the kids wake up to me is just sacred time. And then the other thing that I tried to do was I tried to include them as much as possible. So when I was doing policy work, whether it was with the governor at the state capitol or meeting with a member of Congress, I just brought them with me. And to engage them as much as possible because I wanted them to see, I wanted them to experience it. And what's really interesting is that along the way I thought, like I kept checking in all through their upbringing, like are people making fun of you guys at school? Are you being ridiculed because you have this very outspoken mom on these issues? And now all four of them, justice is, is sort of a core tenant to who they are. So I, would, I, I wouldn't, my, my only suggestion, and it's so personal so I won't dictate anything, but the only thing that I would offer is allow them to participate in it somehow. Let them see what you were doing. When I was being hideously cyberbullied, and I was so early to the cyberbullying, when that TED Talk first came out and when the book came out, when that cyberbullying was happened, I sat the kids in front of the computer and I showed them exactly what people were saying from the safety of anonymity. And I said, am I gonna let somebody who's not even brave enough to do this under their own name tell me who I am or do I know with conviction who I am? And so I think you know, the more that you can engage them, they're just so many amazing life lessons that are, that are part of this whole journey you know that is work and 
and, and really work is, is this self-discovery that we find along the way. Thank you for that. So I'm afraid we're out of time, but Robin's going to be signing books at the back. Um, so grab your book, meet her over there. You can ask further questions then. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank really you. enjoyed this time with you.